Good morning, good afternoon and good evening ladies and gentlemen. We would like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you at the nice global conclave from the lots of the beautiful Himalayas where the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is located. The think tank was established in the month of February in the year 2016. It undertakes independent research in the field of international relations, foreign policy, security studies and development. NICE has four research centers: China Studies, Neighborhood Studies, Non-Traditional Security Studies and Security and Strategic Studies. The institute focuses on eight research topics: climate change and energy, global governance, sustainable development and smart cities, refugee and migration, China's Belt and Road Initiative, border and transboundary water politics, Indo-Pacific affairs, disaster management, and international economy and development. Previously, Nice has had the opportunity to host distinguished speakers from all around the globe. It was a great pleasure inviting me to speak here at Nice. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you. Well, thank you anyway, and I certainly admire the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you all. Nice Global Conclave is the flagship event of the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement Nepal. The theme of the 3-day conference is Connecting Nepal to the World by bringing leaders, diplomats, business leaders and scholars from all around the globe. The objective of the conclave is to introduce Nepal to the world. and at the same time update the nepalese policy makers and experts about the fast changing geopolitics which will help nepal reshape its foreign policy to achieve its national goal this is the session day of the conference and to chair and moderate this session it's a real pleasure to have with us professor dr deepak prakash pat Professor Dr Deepak Prakash Bhatt is a member of Parliament of Nepal and security expert. He is an elected member of House of Representatives at Federal Parliament of Nepal. Additionally, he is a member of International Affairs Committee of the Federal Parliament of Nepal. Dr Bhatt holds a PhD from the School of International Studies Jawaharlal Nehru University New Delhi. Previously, he served as a member of high-level task force on reorienting Nepal's foreign policy, headed by Minister for Foreign Affairs, and as a member of technical committee and secretariat formed for supervision, integration, and rehabilitation of Maoist army combatants. He is also a visiting faculty at Thrubhuvan University. Without any further ado, sir, I request. Word. Thank you. Uh. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, my team. As uh, we have been following this mega event organized by NIS, I I think uh, one of the biggest event during the pandemic, and which is connecting Nepal to the uh, rest of the world, academicians, politicians, thinkers, authors, and researchers. and uh, from the many sectors of uh, day to day life uh thank you all panelists i'm sure that connecting and regional integration in asia you will be talking from the sub regional perspective at the same time from the regional perspective the whole continent itself is is a big uh big issue now as some of the scholars have pointed all uh, in in early 20th century the rise of asia and the fall of the west uh, the many books many articles and many research are pointing that the rise of asia especially the rise of asia from japan to asean singapore to uh, in china india but 
especially the rise of China at this, uh, you know, the first two decades of 21st century has shown some uh, new challenges while talking about the connectivity from land, sea, air, cyber world, space, anywhere in the, you know, like in the, in the universe. So this is how the world is uh, globalized and this global conclave is connecting people from different uh, sectors. So I think uh, it's my pleasure to be here with distinguished panelist, Dr. Bishnu Raju Preti. He is the executive chairperson of the Policy Research Institute, uh, Institute, which is the leading think tank of the government of Nepal, federal government. And for more than two decades, uh, he has been doing research and contributing in the conflict uh, management. And, 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 and uh, previously he was executive chairperson of the Nepal Center for Contemporary Research, had enormous pub, I mean, research and publications. So he doesn't need to you know, say more about uh, his contribution through his uh, academic and the research work. Uh, and he will be talking, I, mean, I don't know, I'm not very uh, aware or prepared, but he will be focusing, but generally what I can say that he can uh, through light from the South Asian perspective. After uh, that, uh, uh, I'm sure that I'm not going to uh, make a, you know, like a long introduction of the panelists. Uh, and then after that, uh, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Azmezka, uh, Kruzeska, and she will be talking uh, from uh, uh, Poland, and I mean, uh, uh, one of the oldest university as ID member, uh, uh, and she will be talking from how, uh, I mean, this continent or the rise of Asia is this look from that particular region. And, and Ria will be talking, she is a uh, research uh, assistant and have been contributing uh, from Delhi about the uh, changes and how social and economic progress is taking shape in region as the Institute C is affiliated for the Center for Social and Economic Progress, contributing about the uh, changes and connectivity in uh, India, India, Pakistan, India, Myanmar, India, Bhutan, Nepal, and Bangladesh, all this sub region. And Dr. Irina uh, Enola Pop, uh, we are hoping that she will be joining soon or had she joined? Okay. Uh, in this context, so I will first invite Dr. Bishnu Raj Upreti, how he is looking this Asian connectivity is taking shape, what we have witnessed in the last two decades and, and the last centuries, I mean, last centuries, last decades have taken uh, the momentum of the globalization has taken and have changed the shape of the modern globalization. So, uh, Dr. Vishnu Raju Prati, floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Vatta. First of all, I would like to express sincere gratitude to Pramodji and Danish for organizing this very pertinent, very big event and also choosing that quite important, quite complex topics and asking me to speak on that topics, connectivity and uh, regional integration in Asia. It's uh, quite uh, complex. So I will be covering, in fact, the entire uh, Asia instead of uh, only uh, South Asia. Uh, for the uh, broader debate and discussion, I will introduce three or four key areas um, citing the complexity, exploring the barrier, um, uh, indicating the broader initiatives and then possible way. So basically, as my uh, professional work is always related with the conflict management and there we always see the some possible options. So knowledge for understanding 
is one part, but understanding for the solution is the another part. That is how we were trained as a conflict uh, scholar. So I will be looking to that option first and foremost. My proposition for the debate in the August gathering is that regional integration uh, and connectivity. These are very interesting term terminology concept. However, in reality, it's a, quite a complex and complicated uh, conceptually, psychologically, and politically when we look to the Asia. Asia is just such a complex, such a complicated uh, uh, geographically, linguistically, culturally, religiously, politically, in every sphere. It is complex in terms of economic development, in terms of uh, political, ideological orientation, all that. So. Um, Connectivity, if we are looking to a very narrow sense of just connecting to a physical connection of the infrastructure, it is one thing. But to materialize that uh, concept, physical infrastructure con context, come with the mentality, psychology of the political decision maker, and not only the political decision maker, even to the large population. So in that context, if um, Culture is different, language is different, tradition is different, geographical vicinity is far away and different infrastructure. In that context, it is quite complex to achieve the regional integration. That was one of my proposition. And the second proposition I am going to do is the barriers. When we are talking about the connectivity, often we are um, uh, relating to the infrastructure. Of course, that is one fundamental important element, but it, it is not enough. When we are talking about the regional integration, connectivity also goes with so many other factors which we have to analyze. And that I am presenting in a framework of the barriers of the connectivity, barriers of the regional integration. So in that, Physical connectivity is one, the uh, multi-transporter, multimodal transport system is one of the effective means of the physical connectivity. Um, uh, but beyond that is also the historical legacy. You see how India-Pakistan are developing, how India-Pakistan historical relation exists, how the North and South Korea exist, how the East Asian country, and all these history also very directly affect to the um, connectivity and also to the integration. Similarly, the security concern and geopolitical positioning of each and every country and the uh, interest of the powerful and the um, survival strategy of the weakest country, these also very much matters while we talk about the connectivity and regional integration. So in that sense, it is extremely important for the scholar, for the political decision maker, for the analyst, to look to this aspect when we are talking about the regional integration in Asia, the largest population, largest economy, everything largest in the world. So in that sense, it is we are not talking very simple about uh, achieving something with a uh, few key actors. It's too complex, but this too complex some efforts are going on and trying by the different institution in terms of physical uh, connectivity, like the Asian Development Bank. It has so many development infrastructure project, connectivity project. Bimistake is also planning its own territorial area. SARC has so many. Uh, Only contributing in my assessment to the broader regional integration of the region. But one question uh, for all of us is that it's not possible to have the integration, regional integration in Asia. Um, or is it, is it perfectly possible to have the complete integration in Asia, like in the Western Europe? So these questions are pulling all of us to think on. For that, what I see. There are several ways and options to 
enhance the regional integration, development um, in other structures is the change which is uh, not easy and it is not in our control but how we can um, uh, little bit enhance that through the other other means other mechanism for example if we are able to make the broader exchange between the academics if we are able to have the uh, collaborative uh, program between the journalists, the parliamentarians of the different countries, uh, between the business person, between the other key actors, social activists, and also find the ways, because in uh, conflict management, we always say that there is always option. So one of the best way is to engage in the research and the um, study to explore the possible ways of the collaboration that always comes with the mutual benefit. So if there is no mutual benefit, this will be only the jargon. This will be only the um, uh, very easy term to talk on. But if there is a mutual benefit and mutual collaboration, the different countries and then they will come to the uh, common forum and then it, it will exert the pressure to the political decision makers to have the um, uh, broader collaboration among the countries between the countries and between the region and in Uh, it seems to Dr. Preeti is facing power cuts or some technical problems. Uh, I think uh, we should wait for a reconnection to the uh, to the program but uh in meanwhile uh shall i invite uh our speaker professor dr adunishka dr Brady. very sorry very sorry just uh, my internet connection was broken anyway i am um, finishing saying that connectivity is quite important and for the con connectivity provides the basis for the broader regional integration but connectivity alone is not the um, key element for achieving the uh, regional integration and other areas like the social political economic and the research academic exchanges are equally important and we have to look to the possible solution explore the options debate on that working together in all level will help to develop the regional integration thank you very much if there are any uh, questions and concerns i can share my perspective again thank you thank you dr upreti uh hope we all have uh, enjoyed his presentation and maybe if someone have any query or we can mm, we can spend some time on that now i would like to invite professor dr agnieszka kurdzieszka if i am pronouncing right Perhaps professor mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. she is uh, a professor at the institute of the middle and far east uh, at the Jagodonian University, as I mentioned, at the Poland's one of the oldest university and the one of the oldest university of the world. As I mentioned at the beginning, that Asia, where where we are talking about the regional integration in Asia, Asia itself has its different identities. We call them far west or the West Asia, and there is South Asia, there is Southeast Asia, there is East Asia or the Northeast Asia, there is Central Asia. So these sub sub regions of the Asia are there and are we looking really a real connectivity or uh, you know as i mentioned there are connectivity in terms of uh, many uh, many poles uh, is this taking shape or is this possible while we are talking about the rise of east rise of asia something like that so how she looks from the uh, 
her perspective or the bus or the, the study she has been doing uh, regarding the uh, regional integration in Asia. So, Professor, floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I would like to extend my gratitude for inviting me to take part in this remarkable event which connects practitioners and scholars together. Thank you, Dr. Pramod, as well, for, for organizing this, uh, this conference. And uh, without any delay, I will proceed uh, with my speech uh, about uh, South Central Asia connectivity based on my research. I've been doing in, mostly in South Asia, but also in Central Asia the last few years. And obviously, um, I will be talking from the perspective of a person living in, uh, in the most integrated regions in the world, in the European Union, benefiting from this integration um, for more than a dec decade. But Poland uh, entered the EU in 2004, and since then it has developed tremendously, uh, both politically but also economically. Uh, so therefore, my key argument is that um, connectivity, regional integration, uh, which is itself a multidimensional phenomenon, uh, is uh, one of the most important elements of current uh, geopolitics based on multilateralism, uh, with different players uh, uh, taking, undertaking, materializing different strategies and interests. And I would also uh, emphasize the fact that both the policies of superpowers or great powers, great regional global powers are important, but also the policies of smaller states like small powers uh, are exceptionally important. And I would um, even refer to Nepal as a small power in the region capable of introducing its own policy uh, while being located in tremendously a difficult uh, area. I mean, geostrategically between uh, geostrategically between uh, China and India, uh, South Asia and Central Asia. I think if we discuss uh, the connectivity within Asia, uh, I think this, these two regions are somehow naturally and historically they have historically inherited um, linkages and cooperation systems. So therefore, uh, these two regions are like, I would say, natural partners, but obviously partners to expand cooperation, but obviously there are many challenges with regard to this issue. Uh, so therefore, uh, I, um, I think that uh, um, these two regions will play uh, the mo more and more important role in, in, in its current um, security system. And I argue that uh, if we discuss South Central Asia connectivity, it, this discussion, this investigation should be contextualized as a multidimensional challenge to be, um, to be analyzed uh, with reference to the three pillars, intra-regional, which uh, involves internal dynamics uh, within both regions, within South and Central Asia, interregional uh, between South and Central Asia as two entities, uh, distinctive entities with uh, their distinctive identities, obviously, and diverse challenges, but also affinities. And also like over-regional uh, aspect or pillar geostrategic, uh, which involves the competition with external powers, external, I mean, beyond South and Central Asia, like China, obviously, and Russia, uh, obviously, the containing China from uh, India's perspective is uh, one of the major uh, geostrategic goal, and it will remain so in the foreseeable future. So uh, I will briefly uh, refer to all these three pillars now, like the first one, the intra regional South Asia, as we know, unfortunately, South Asia is the least integrated regions in the world due to the protracted in the Pakistani conflict. And unfortunately, these two uh, players uh, engaged in, to, in this conflict, uh, they somehow, to a large extent or decisively even, they shape the entire uh, narrative within South Asia. So if there is a research done on South Asia, it is, it is um, 
uh, Iraq security related research, it's primarily focused on the protracted uh, uh, conflict between India and Pakistan. And th these relations, unfortunately, contribute to the fact that South Asia does not have uh, um, the noteworthy uh, planned and long term strategies which are focused on uh, on uh, intra-regional uh, integration and cooperation so it has also impact this escalation prone conflict as we know uh, with this major like rising nationalism on in both countries it has had a, an impact on uh, limiting prospects for expanding cooperation also with south asia by india for example uh, permanent rivalry, I would uh, argue, between New Delhi and Islamabad weakens both states and their position as regional players. As Murat Lamulin wrote uh, a decade ago, while India and Pakistan fight each other for the expansion of their prospective influence in Central Asia, other uh, states gain actual economic and political power in the region. Other states obviously he meant uh, both Russia uh, with its traditional sphere of influence in Central Asia and, of course, the rising China. Uh, Central Asia itself is a very interesting geopolitically, geostrategically, when we discuss this dynamics within the region, it is an extremely important and interesting region uh, um, of population of more than 72 million people incorporating the so-called former uh, Soviet Republic states. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, uh, Tajikistan, uh, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Mm, obviously, uh, what we know, the first thing which comes to our mind when we talk about Central Asia is, is that uh, most of these countries, they are extremely rich in strategic resources, like Kazakhstan's oil reserves are estimated to be 11th largest in the world. Uzbekistan has numerous other resources, uh, including gas, petroleum, gold, and so on. And the economies of these countries depend heavily on the production and export of natural gas, oil, petrochemicals. Uh, uh, so therefore, for them, connectivity uh, is, uh, is a matter of uh, security related uh, goal in their uh, policy. At the same time, uh, this region has uh, undergone a very interesting transformation uh, after 91, uh, obviously, but uh, later as well, in the 21st century especially, um, we can see that the leaders of Central Asian republics are undertaking different uh, endeavors to de-Sovietize, I would say, the perception of Central Asia to shape uh, <clears throat> its separate identity and obviously to diversify uh, oil gas transportation linkages but also go beyond um, this uh, um, resource related perception of the region and to include uh, as dr upreti said interconnectivity it's not only uh, the uh, in linkages in terms of uh, transportation but also uh, there are many, like there are multiple different levels of such cooperation, like academic, uh, artists, and uh, all uh, elements which include the soft power projection as well. So uh, this is what uh, Central Asian uh, republics are trying to uh, engage with. Uh, so that's why I would argue that this is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. But at the same time, we also have uh, multiple problem in Central Asia, not only with uh, regards to uh, economic issues, but also political. As we know, like countries like Turkmenistan are also authoritarian states. Turkmenistan was one of the most repressive in terms of political rights, civil liberties, which are completely denied in practice in this country. And economy is dominated by the state, corruption, systemic. Uh, diverse different persecution and so on and so forth. Never experience a peaceful transfer of power, which is also important you know, for the development, political and economic development of the country. Therefore, here, if we talk about India, which projects itself as a democratic country, 
a strengthening and supporting rules-based democracy, it may have a tremendous role to play in Central Asia, strengthening democratic uh, uh, transitions or helping somehow to uh, these countries to uh, undergo uh, certain elements of demo pro-democratic transition. Uh, so this is like, uh, I would say, uh, one of the uh, elements uh, on which distinguish India among uh, other competitors, Russia or China, its uh, democratic system, uh, obviously facing tremendous challenges under BJP regime. And this, I think we all know, but nonetheless, if we compare India with China or with Russia, uh, still we do have a country which is based on largely democratic uh, system. And uh, if we uh, discuss the second uh, uh, pillar, uh, like the South Central Asia, which already I mentioned, the India uh, element, we do have uh, certain uh, linkages that we cannot deny that civilizational, uh, cultural, and uh, different relations between Central Asia, South Asia flourished since ancient times. Uh, due to geographical proximity and geocultural affinity. So these are the elements which should not be wasted and it should be regarded as a framework for future relations. Um, of course, the post-World War II uh, dynamics has shaped uh, the uh, bilateral relations. So there are three crucial moments, like firstly, the end of a brutal British colonialism in South Asia, a partition of the subcontinent, which has direct impact on geostrategic and geopolitical situation in, in South Asia. 1947, the independence of India and the emergence of uh, uh, um, the inception of Pakistan, which opened definitely a new chapter with which the entire region, the entire region has to face because, for example, India lost its uh, its direct uh, connection, uh, geographical connection to Central Asia. And since then, also because of the conflict, India has to introduce certain policies to encircle Pakistan, uh, uh, for example, by uh, strengthening cooperation in Chabahar port in Iran, uh, trying to establish relations there and somehow reach Central Asia from that side, which also has uh, impact on the entire uh, security system. So. And um, during the Cold War as well, there were uh, relations between India and Central Asia due to Indian Soviet strategic alliance, uh, which made uh, India's culture present in the lives of the people of Central Asia. And when I was talking with people in Kyrgyzstan, in Uzbekistan, with people there, they, they mentioned, they, they, they remember movies, music, cultural exchanges also between India and Central Asia. Uh, and the second crucial um, pillar or element, uh, turning point, uh, is obviously uh, the transformation, geopolitical transformation after 91. And then uh, the third uh, turning point is uh, 21st century, where um, South Asia um, became uh, a region which is regarded as crucial by Central Asian republics. Uh, and India, for example, and there is also a Belt and Road initiate, initiative, which is a crucial point of reference uh, for uh, South Asian countries, although they do have different perspective for uh, BRI, like Pakistan is uh, uh, cooperating with China under the CPEC project, uh, considering China is its most uh, crucial ally right now. <clears throat> and India regards these issues in a completely different uh, uh, way, as we know. So Connect Central Asia policy was unveiled by India uh, in the India-Central Asia dialogue in Bishkek uh, in 2012. So that is an interesting uh, project which, call, which called for establishing uh, multi-layered uh, cooperation, like establishing uh, hospitals, universities, e-network, telemedicine connecting India, joint commercial ventures, uh, boost trade and tourism, scientific research, and strategic partnerships um, to overcome the major role, the major task is to overcome the major disadvantage, lack of direct connectivity, and not to be left uh, behind the rivalry with China, which started Belt and Road Initiative. And there, 
Uh, if I men may mention also the role of Nepal, which could be very interesting as a small power here, balancing between India and China. Nepal could also uh, be an alternative route, which could link India through, uh, uh, which could link India with uh, Central Asian republics through China. But obviously, uh, when Nepal cooperates with China under the BRI, India regards it as a some sort of threat to its own interest and, and like a sphere of interest. India is not part of BRI, but definitely uh, these dynamics may enhance the role of Nepal in this this power uh, rivalry in the region and also the challenge is the unstable relations with pakistan wow. and the third last pillar i would finish the competition with russia china which we already know china is entering central asia it has increased its uh, its uh, its relations um, also under shanghai cooperation organization in which also india pakistan uh, uh, our member uh, since 2017. And my last words that is that uh, Central Asia wants to diversify its strategy and contacts to develop mutually benefiting relations on multiple level. But within Central Asia, there is this major problem, the conflict, uh, which will rather continue. It's in, rather in the foreseeable future in the Pakistani conflict will not be resolved. And I would regard it as a major hurdle, hurdle uh, to South Asia's development and expanding its its uh, interregional cooperation with South Asia and other regions as well, but particularly South Asia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Agnieszka. Uh, uh, I think these two panelists have focused on, uh, you know, the soft power of dimensions of connectivity or especially the regional integration or the sub-regional integration at the same time the multi-dimensional engagement in the sub-sub region maybe the south central region or uh, all these kind of things but at the same time southeast asia and as i mentioned east asia as we call our earlier northeast asia so this uh, this is a use of uh, the big uh, 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 continent or you know the asia itself is is uh, diverse in terms of regional integration so the very fascinating idea uh, in terms of uh, not only focusing on the geopolitical or the geostatic strategic dimension of the heavy infra infrastructure or related uh, mentality of the connectivity and now uh, i will invite uh, ria sina she is a uh, research associate uh, formerly with brookings uh, which is known as the brookings india uh, now uh, is the, the institute uh, is known as the Center for Social and the Economic Progress. And see, uh, definitely, I'm not sure, as uh, have been focusing on the connectivity in South Asia, uh, will be focusing on that. And of course, uh, she will be touching on the intra sub regional uh, dimensions of the connectivity or the regional integration in Asia. So, floor is yours, Ria. Thank you, Chair, uh, and good afternoon, everyone from New Delhi. I would just like to share my screen for a presentation. Um, is this visible? Yeah. To everyone? All right. Thank you. All right. So today I want to focus on India's connectivity approach towards South Asia, particularly the evolution of it. And to and you know what the drivers of connectivity for India are today with its neighboring countries. Um, just to dive in previous panelists as well that India's uh, over the last seven decades, India has looked at its neighborhood through a very security oriented prism, and. And uh, as a result of this, and, and you know, this is exemplified through various statements made by different leaders in the last seven decades. And as a result of which, what has happened today is that we do not know enough about what goes on in the neighborhood um, beyond, you know, beyond the India-Pakistan prism, as Professor Agnieszka was also alluding to, that there's a uh, there's an overemphasis on India-Pakistan, and we don't know what's happening with the rest of the neighborhood. And uh, uh, the previous Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, in 2008 very well said it, that a lot of our thinking about these countries 
industries is influenced excessively by Western notions of what's going on. Um, a result of this disconnectivity, this regional insulation strategy that India followed, you know, since the time of independence, since the end of the British era, to possibly the early, you know, late 1980s and early 1990s, um, it's manifested in a number of ways. For example, you know, South Asia, as we know, is the least integrated region in the world compared to 29% of ASEAN or even 22% of Sub-Saharan African countries as per World Bank study. And then as the regions looked at trading more globally, they did not uh, look enough at trading internally. And as a result of which our land-based trade with Myanmar is almost the same as our trade with uh, you know, the distant Nicaragua in Central America. I, uh, railway links with, in terms of infrastructure, railway links with Bangladesh um, decreased. Today, it takes about, um, it's actually three times cheaper and easier to send a container from New Delhi to Singapore than to send it to near the neighboring country, Dhaka. And of course, it's easier to sometimes fly to other regions in the world. We have better air connectivity with other countries of the world than within the region. Until a certain point of time, it was quite easier to get a visa for, a, for an American or a Chinese citizen to get a visa for India than you know, for the neighboring countries to have access to visa. But this process, this whole thing has started changing since the 1990s and early 2000s. And there are several drivers, there are several factors for this connectivity, which I cover in the drivers for connectivity section. First is, of course, the geostrategic response to uh, the Chinese influx in the region. China has been investing massively in the region starting the early 2000s. It's uh, since 2005. It has increased trade with the South Asian countries enormously. And today, it trades five times more with India's neighboring countries as compared to India. Of course, except India and Bhutan, all the neighboring countries are part of the Belt and Road Initiative. China and Nepal have even conducted a joint military exercise. China has investments in Sri Lankan Po City, in Port City, and Dhaka Stock Exchange. That is one of the big drivers for India to increase its connectivity, to reform its connectivity agenda with the neighboring countries. The second factor I want to focus on here is South Asia is you know, especially after the opening up of economic liberalization in the 1990s, South Asia is one of the fastest growing regions in the world with an average growth recording of 9%. This growth is also being recognized by the neighboring, you know, by smaller states in India, such as Assam and Tripura, which neighbor the South Asian countries. And they want, um, particularly the North and other Northeastern countries, which are landlocked and they look at Bangladesh and Myanmar as routes for access to sea for the economic development to connect to the supply chains of Southeast Asian countries. And Nepal, Myanmar, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka have also positioned themselves as entry and exit hubs with other region. Professor Agnieszka was alluding to how Nepal can be used as a route, you know, through China to connect to Central Asia. That's just one of the ways that, you know, there are potential possibilities of linkages. Culturally, also the BJP has focused on um, the BJP has focused on an overall quest for cultural reunion in the region, and this is also reflected through how Prime Minister Modi is attending, for example, you know he's going to Pashupatina Temple in Nepal or attending the Buddhist Vesak celebrations in Sri Lanka. Even the Indian Council for Cultural Relations is, uh, you know, very actively pursuing a public policy based on shared democratic values. Now, in 2014, India started the neighborhood first, uh, you know, India made this whole connectivity agenda as a policy program in the form of neighborhood first, which uh, Prime Minister Modi said rest on five pillars, trade, investment, assistance, development, cooperation, and people-to-people -people contacts. It is based on the realization that there have been historic linkages that we have linked destinies, and these need to be connected in terms for us to have shared prosperity. So from a region, you know, that was, uh, from, as a country that was, that followed a policy of regional insulation, India now looks more as becoming a champion of regionalism in South Asia and connecting to the larger Bay of Bengal and the Indo-Pacific region. Now, a lot of times we focus on, you know, there's a lot of competition and that India is not doing enough or there are several spheres that, you know, connectivity is not adequate, but I also want to focus on some of the successes that have happened at the ground level as a result of the policies of 2000s and as continuing under the neighborhood first policy. First is of course, there has been growth in new forms of infrastructure. Many integrated check posts have come on in the border areas. 
we have south asia's first petroleum pipeline between india and nepal inland waterway route has uh, you know many pilot projects uh, have been conducted south asia satellite has been launched and these are some of the infrastructure initiatives in terms of diplomatic in terms of state visits and diplomatic visits prime minister modi has made twice as many visits compared to his predecessors he visited nepal after a gap of 20 years and sri lanka after a gap of 40 years the first indian defense minister visit to bangladesh happened in 2018 within india also several organizational changes are taking place the ministry of external affairs is waking up to the new reality of the region there's an indo pacific division that established state governments also are involved in um, in in this whole regional connectivity agenda for example the government of assam has an act east division now bhutan has a consulate in assam several institution and technical um, successes can also be alluded for we finalized a land boundary and coastal shipping agreement with bangladesh um, activated the ecta system for uh, for easier transit of nepali cargo from indian seaports tir convention was signed for easing the customs processes india has also been providing financial incentives to private sector companies in india who are um, engaged in constructing infrastructure projects in the neighboring countries and is providing a lot of assistance to them and finally of course the uh, so not finally but yeah the indo pacific cooperation is also one of the biggest factors over here that sort of continues to guide india's regional connectivity agenda and lastly i want to focus on the covid-19 response of course not the immediate one but at least in in 2020 there was a one day bharat mission where evacuation of people from the neighboring countries to place supply of essential goods and vaccine maitri where more than 60 million doses of vaccination was provided of course more needs to be done on that front but the situation but we will see as the situation evolves in in the region uh, so the, now within these successes sorry uh, you have one minute to wrap up because we will be having you know the follow up okay sure yes of course i'll wrap up please so one of the successes one of the paradoxes of the neighborhood first policy for india is it's doing more than ever in the region but since the competition is so high there is an increasing demand for india to do even more and i would like to wrap up by just um, putting forward some you know some pointers for the way forward on what can be done for connectivity for instance india should focus uh, holistically focus on connectivity and maybe not compete in terms of compete with china in terms of economic aid but focus on other forms of connectivity like educational scholarships supporting tourism increasing air connectivity visa restrictions of course institutional uh, institutional changes institutional uh, changes are very important in this front and we need to focus on economic openness through improvement in connectivity infrastructure because that is essentially our delivery on these projects will determine where india stands in this whole uh, regional connectivity agenda um lastly for in terms of regional organization there has to we have to steer away from making it a security oriented organization and mo- and focus more on uh, economic cooperation within these and uh, the last point that i want to conclude with your as professor priti also alluded to there is a need for wider engagement beyond the government with think tanks with civil societies in the neighboring countries that's going to shape our regional connectivity agenda uh, i'll stop here thank you uh thank you ria for your excellent presentation uh, i think we have a time limitation and you all have made uh, extensive uh uh presentation so uh dr upreeti professor agnieszka uh, uh and ria if you have uh something related like for example uh, dr upreeti has been talking about the soft power you know like the not the formal structures connectivity only then do you see the shark shafta and the bimstek like you know the sub sub regional and there's uh, these kind of institutions are 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 uh, losing their relevance or you know like are uh, coming back to the track uh, if you want to say something uh, quickly dr ukreti and then the uh, professor agnieszka uh, you can put some light on the great game rivalry between india and china in between uh, these two uh, you know uh, uh, rising powers and finally from ria if you can can put uh, one you know like say something like one liner uh, regarding the 
possibility of the BIM, BIM stack and the BBIN uh, engagement or, or, or like that. So Dr. Upreti. Thank you, thank you, Raksha. Uh, basically, I have uh, two or three points to share in this regard. Are the existing bigger uh, structure which is supposed to really promote the collaboration and working together like SARC? Be um, mistake to some extent, uh, ASEAN and this structure. In my um, consistent observation, I don't believe that the way they are dealing with that, the way always uh, focusing to the strategic interest of on and pulling uh, others to fulfill that, it will not work. Of course, it will work to develop the infrastructure, but if this infrastructure is not able to properly utilize by the people, and then at that time, it may not work. There are several connecting points between India and Pakistan, physically. But are they really able to use this infrastructure? So the first and foremost fundamental issue is the mindset. To what extent we want to mutually collaborate, mutually support each other, and irrespective of the size, strategic interest, if we want to promote that type of the integration, for example, when we look to the Europe, my 10 years of um, um, study and staying there, I had a chance to very closely look how the Western Europe, the Eastern Europe, and later is the broader Europe was integrated. Are we thinking in the similar way? If we are thinking we need to change the current um, tactical uh, approach of dealing with the <laughs> connectivity. That is my, my conclusion. Con Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Upreti. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for uh, your you know, valuable points. As we see regional or the regional integration, regionalism is, is working in a different parts of the world. At the same time, if you look at the Europe, the European Union, the advanced level of the cooperation at regional, uh, you know, like uh, regionalism, uh, the question of identity of the Britain has dominated. And now, uh, you know, joining hands with U.S. in terms of uh, NATO to compete or contain China is a, is a big question in the Europe also. So that is very how we look at the you know hard security point of view uh, in Jewish strategy. But in South Asia, still we yes in the Asia we have nuclear powers, uh, middle sized you know like uh, countries like Nepal, small countries like Bhutan are landlocked. There are many questions. So uh, we'll be uh, talking about all these broader issues in the coming days. Uh, uh, now, Professor uh, uh, Agneska, Agneska, if you put some light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. But, but I would say that we can uh, uh, refer to such comparative analysis. I mean, look at uh, Europe. 70 years after the Second World War, I can freely travel to Germany. There is no border. There were so many century long conflicts between France and Germany, and now they cooperate within one. Uh, entity and they uh, they have uh, common policy. Of course, uh, there are certain differences, but they can cooperate. Uh, so I think that uh, in South Asia, it is also possible, but the key is to resolve the conflict between India and Pakistan, which I regard as a post-colonial heritage. And I think that until India and Pakistan resolve Kashmir conflict, they are incapable of of developing and, and uh, introducing a regional cooperation. I mean, why we should regard Asian uh, culture as different than European or Western in terms of prosperity for the people, for the nations, economic prosperity, connectivity. If we have international law, if we have international, uh, internationally or globally uh, perceived human rights, why we should argue that uh, certain rights are uh, we, you can introduce in certain regions and in certain regions not. Okay. I think it is absolutely possible. You, and the TAPI, just one, uh, one remark, the TAPI project, because there is a question. I think this is a very important and interesting, the connectivity uh, through the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India project. But all, of course, it will face tremendous challenges okay. due to the deteriorating situation in Afghanistan. Thank you, Professor Agnieszka. Uh, now, uh, last but not the least, uh, uh, one liner, something like that, Ria, you can do, you can say something like, you know, the SAR 
is losing its relevance, but to how uh, and what are the possibilities about the BIMSTEC or BBIM, as you were pointing the way forward? Yes, Sark, of course, it will be held hostage to India-Pakistan relations till the time, as Professor was mentioning, that you know the India-Pakistan conflict over Kashmir is resolved, but there are possibilities of making progress through BBIN and BIMSTEC. BIMSTEC trade agreement is, all, is near finalization and BBIN. Um, a lot of pilot projects on EBI and corridors have taken place. So I think this is the way okay. forward. If SARC doesn't work, then I think these two will be the way forward. Thank you again. Thank you, panelists. And thank you all those who have been listening, questioning, or interacting in this, uh, in this very uh, uh, prominent issue and, and the, uh, the, the session, connectivity and regional cooperation in Asia, focusing on the sub-sub-regions. So uh, thank you, Nimesh, and thank you, nice team. Thank you, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, and thank you all uh, for this, this active participation and, and making this success. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. So at the end, uh, we'd like to give both a thanks to uh, all the speakers. Distinguished Chair, Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen, as we have come to the end of this session, we would like to express our sincere gratitude and thanks to the Chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. Our sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session.